Uh, okay, so I'm actually very happy to participate in this debate, and uh, I thank Talent and uh, Yadin for inviting me uh, to this. Actually, I, I had an idea this is, a, this is a debate. Now I understand it should be more like a dialogue, so I'm more happy debate about it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, <coughs> and since I expect that it will probably drift a lot from what uh, my uh, initial thoughts about it, so I thought maybe i just give a few minutes just to see to say what I thought that this debate should be about, and then... So at least I will state a little bit of what I, uh, you know, I think we, would be interesting for us to debate, but since we didn't practice anything, and uh, I have no idea of what we'll end up talking about. So uh, <coughs> I think for me at least the main question in uh, memory is that uh, we don't really know how it works. 
and especially in, uh, in the kinds of memory which I think are most interesting for us, for humans, and for me personally, like a long-term memory, uh, we have no idea uh, what is the mechanism, really. So I know my name is Misha, and I know uh, what's the name of my first uh, teacher. I know a lot of things, and, uh, but it's not clear still, and there is no experimental even clue about how this information is stored in my brain. Is it in synapses or in DNA, etc.? So I think uh, this is uh, maybe, if, if we can discuss this a little bit, what are the possibilities, this would be interesting. Now, I want to say, and this is my uh, part of a debate, so I want really my claim about the, uh, the, the field, the whole field of memory, is that the experimental studies, unfortunately, are not really rooted in theory. And... Uh, and I'm arrogant enough to say that there is a certain price for this to pay because this leads to the situation where experiments are not focused uh, and uh, the main concepts are, it's hard to define the main concepts uh, if it's not in the, in the framework of, of a theory. And the reason for this is that memory is such a fascinating uh, field that there are a lot of ideas about how to do experiments, but uh, if they are not unified by something, then at the end we are left with uh, a lot of interesting results uh, which are not, uh, it's not clear if they really advance us towards this main game, the goal is to understand how, how, the, uh, how memory actually works. Now, I would want to claim, if I have time, is that uh, we, there is a certain theory of how memory works. So people were thinking about it, there is a, and in fact, uh, I, I would say computational neuroscience as a field started as a model of theory, uh, as a model of memory. So this, there is a certain uh, theoretical framework uh, which may be completely wrong, but it still exists. And uh, I must say, when I was thinking about this, uh, I'm working a lot on this, and I realized really by somehow mentally preparing for this debate that this actually this uh, framework, this theory is a pretty paradoxical one. And I think because these debates are so rare and we don't talk to people uh, from other uh, disciplines that this is uh, not very appreciated, that we have a theory, but this is a very paradoxical one. So I think it would be interesting to discuss uh, what are the paradoxical features of this theory compared to uh, what naively you would think about how memory works. And uh, then I would say that this theory, even though it exists, it didn't really uh, manage to address the most crucial issues in memory research and it didn't, and as a result, there are no proposals for really good critical experiments. So I'm really wondering maybe now, if we manage to have a good informal discussion, maybe we can come up with some uh, ideas for the experiments. Okay, so this is uh, uh, what I hope that we can achieve today. And now, let me give it to... Just a bit. So, first of all, I wish to... Yeah. Thank you very much. I wish, uh, again, to thank uh, Tali and all the others for inviting us here. And uh, it's really a joy to be here. Uh, Misha and I didn't really prepare, although luckily from time to time we talk. And uh, I think it's an opportunity for us to discuss things in public that we didn't in depth did before, although we tried from time to time. So I would like to start with some, it's not really a presentation, but to clarify from the outset, what's my problem? Not personal problem, professional problem, but sometimes it's the same. But even before that, I, after hearing Misha, I wish to state from my point of view that there is no theory in biology at all. Theory, as far as I remember from my studies, there is only one profession in which there is a theory, one discipline, that's physics. We don't have theories, we have models, and there is a very big difference, with, a difference between them. For me, a theory is a body of knowledge which is constrained by some basic rules and connections and, and translational rules. And I think that probably this is what attracted many physicists into biology and into brain research, that they think that they can create a theory of that, but we are so far away from that. 
and I'll try to delve into it a little bit later. So let's decide if you agree that we talk about models and not yeah, theory. Okay. That's fine. So later on, we might want to discuss what's a useful model, because those of you who are familiar with uh, Borges, uh, the Argentinian uh, writer who had the mind of a scientist, he uh, discussed that in a very nice chapter, but we'll leave it to the end. What's, what's a good model? So my uh, uh, words of introduction are entitled uh, My Life with Theoreticians. And this is actually a risky title because my wife is not a theoretician, but uh, I risk my, my neck. So I would say the following regarding the, the, the issues that uh, uh, Misha brought, brought up. First, that uh, a fundamental assumption of the neuroscience of memory is that encoding, which means the transformation of information about the world in a language that is spoken by the nervous system, this is of course a metaphor that I'm using, uh, of new information involves a physical change in the neural system that encodes that memory. This is important because as far as I know, Misha has some reservations with regard to the use of the physical traits. Now, this physical record of experience uh, in memory research is called the engram. This is just a term that is interchangeable with a physical trace of experience in biological tissue. It was not originally created for memory. Semon, who coined it in 1904, created it in general, it, it suggested in general for any biological uh, tissue. So nowhere in the concept of the engram is there a requirement concerning the level of embodiment of the physical change. So uh, the people who work on neuroscience of memory search for the engram. There is a beautiful paper uh, from 1950s by Lashley in search of the engram. Uh, we might mention it later. But nobody really knows where the engram is. And this is very important concerning some of the issues that I think uh, uh, Misha worries about. So in part of the last century, and I wish just to take it out, sort of off the table, because of simplification, lack of resolution, and knowledge, which is fine because we lack knowledge as well and resolution, and attempts were made, attempts were made to localize the engram at the gross anatomical level, which means the idea, the simple idea was go to the brain, find a place, this is where the memory is. And this mostly failed. Uh, and that's the beautiful paper by Lashley 1950. If uh, Tali wishes, I can distribute the PDF if you don't have it uh, to you and you distribute it to others because it's a little bit difficult to get. Maybe it's not so difficult to get. And, but even Lashley himself in 1929 in his famous book, which never became famous, uh, uh, said a prediction that it will fail because he said memory is distributed, highly distributed. So he was himself, because of the urge to find something, in the 25 years after that, tried to locate in the brain by using lesions, which is something that biologists are uh, in doing since then, um, tried to locate the engram, although he himself thought it will be impossible to find because it distributed all over the place. He was reflecting mainly the attempts to find the cortical engram. Engram that it's not something which is a reflex. It's not a plesia. So we remove, a, and also there, if you wish to discuss, we can discuss it. Even in a plesia, the engram is distributed. So if you look into the papers, they reflect maybe 5, 10% of the memory that is supposed to, to be there. So assumptions and caveat number two. Cognitive neuroscience has long posited that the behavioral manifestation of the engram is labile and memory is reconstructive. Something we should note, there is a beautiful book, 1932, Bartlett, uh, Remembering, uh, which is highly recommended to whoever studies memory, whether theoretician or not. It's a beautiful book. It's the book that started social neuroscience. And uh, there he, he shows something which is intuitively understood by almost everybody, that your memory is not something which is stable, and uh, there was a resurrection of this in the 90, in 1990s in the United States because of legal reasons, not because of scientific biological reasons. People started to litigate um, issues related to false memory, and then they said, how come memory is established? But, and then they found out that actually in cognitive neuroscience will always say, uh, well, most of cognitive neuroscience, that memory is reconstructed. So this has to do with the issues that we are going to dis discuss later, whether memory is an engram that is there or is it changed. And uh, neuroscience since then, maybe since uh, the year 2000, which is considered as a step function in, in studies of memory because of reasons that we can discuss later, uh, uh, tilted toward and verified that, form, the, that view 
uh, and by identifying molecular, cellular, and system mechanisms that render the engram, and I'm using now engram throughout, restless, which means it's there, but it's, 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 it's eluding us. It's not the same engram that people like McGaw who are very smart and very good, but at the 60s or 70s still wrote the memory is fixed in the engram. No, the engram is not fixed. And I wish to take your uh, two or three minutes by uh, showing the, uh, sort of confronting the two uh, ideas, because they relate, I think, to what uh, uh, we, we discuss from time to time. So the classical uh, account, which I call the outdated account, but again, it's a heuristic statement, because maybe I'm wrong, and in 20 years from now, somebody will send students say they thought this is the case, was that if you take uh, the error of time, uh, the event will cause, will lead to a stable engram. And this leads to STM, it's a short-term memory, and consolidation, which is the process in which memory becomes from the short, in, uh, it comes to be a long-term memory. And then there is storage, quote-unquote, it's obviously a metaphor, although not all biologists probably will take it as a metaphor at first glance, but also not all theoreticians. And then long-term memory, and the memory is fixed in long-term memory. And this leads to two, uh, th this rests on two and a half assumptions, which are the only theoretical assumptions uh, at that level of analysis in memory research that I know, and they are both wrong. Uh, up to the year 2000, uh, the year, uh, uh, yeah, ten, 10 years ago. When I say wrong, I'm not going to repeat it again, maybe I'm wrong, but that's what we think now. One is something that is related to HEB. We had discussions, uh, Misha and I, about HEB because uh, Misha brought me a paper by the late Daniel Amit, Daniel Amit debating something with me. Unfortunately, he didn't publish that paper and I couldn't reply. And uh, Danny was an extremely smart person and uh, a debate with him would, it's not that I want to you know. Uh, a debate with him would have been a joy and we discussed things in the past together uh, so he, he cites HEB and claiming that we in memory research do not know how to use what HEB said. And this is something we can discuss because I think that HEB said more than one thing. He also said that the thing he is most known for is not his original uh, statement, and that's the Hebian postulate that we use in various variants. Doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that he was not extremely useful in, and, and smart in formulating in the right way, but it leads years back. And one of the things he said, if you look at the book and uh, try to translate it into uh, doable science, it's the dual trace hypothesis. He was not the first one. Uh, James said it in 1901, I don't remember. And that's that memory exists in short term and long term. So the memory is a dual trace. And dual trace means that the short term is labile. It's an oxymoron. Actually, it's very difficult to erase short-term memory. It's very easy to erase long-term, but in biology, you usually say short-term is labile and long-term is stable. And the idea is that short-term is etched into the tissue, and uh, so the memory goes from short into long. And the second one, the consolidation hypothesis, is that to go from short into long, you have to go through a process of consolidation, which is actually a maturation process. So uh, the, the models in biology of memory were influenced very much by development in developmental neuroscience, in developmental biology, and the idea that when your brain studies, learns something, there is a developmental process that leads your brain into a stage where it cannot go back. It's there. It's, it's permanent. And the consolidation means consolidation just once per item, which means that you consolidate only once per item. So here is the replacement of recent years. It's not as complex as it is, actually, and it dates back to 1973, but as many dogmas in biology, it was pushed under the rug for many years, and people didn't accept papers that uh, described it. So uh, the idea here is that you have encoding, and the idea here is that memory doesn't exist as short versus long, but as active and inactive forms. And nobody defines what inactive is, but active means that the uh, uh, representation is somehow uh, uh, doing something. So you can decide for yourself what's in, not inactive, because it's possible maybe to see whether it's active. It's very difficult to say whether something is inactive. So encoding occur, occurs when the memory is active, because you acquire information. And then there is a consolidation process, which leads to a phase in which the memory becomes inactive, because it's not used at that particular point in time. So T1 here would, not be, acti it would be active, and T2 not. And then the memory goes back into active memory when you use it. And when we use it, 
there is a regain of plasticity, which we call in the literature reconsolidation, but it's not identical to consolidation. And this is a, a, a always, or almost always, in order for consolidation to occur, you need an encoding part. So you have to learn something new when you express the memory. And therefore, the memory will never be the same. So it goes active, inactive, and then there are loops, and encoding leads to reconsolidation, and the memory goes another a, a step. So event leads to a modifiable engram. So, uh, so let me explain. So if uh, the first time after two years that I uh, uh, recall uh, uh, an event, it would be the same as the classical picture. There was an active memory consolidation and the, the this would have been correct had I not been uh, emphasizing that we do not know what's inactive. So, for example, uh, if you take active only as reactivation of the memory and retrieval, then you're right. The first time I retrieve it, it's there. So that's why I used to say in my classes that the best, most faithful memory is the memory of an amnesiac, because you never use it. Okay, so you didn't use it for two years, it's the same memory. But it becomes clearer and clearer that memory is active also when you are not consciously or uh, ex explicitly retrieve it. For example, in some phases of sleep and in some interaction of the information with new information that comes from other locations. So the idea is that the memory is very likely to be active during these two years and change the, the, the engram. So, so why does it matter if, it is, uh, if it's not a conscious process of Yes. You are using a metaphor that I object to, but uh, suppose we forget about the metaphor of the hard disk because metaphors are something I'm going to say a word about. Uh, uh, the, the idea is, so I don't see the problem, which means I'm looking for a mechanism that keeps the memory going. The memory keeps, uh, is kept going uh, throughout time. Sometimes you retrieve it, and then you add information that occurs at that point in time, and sometimes you don't retrieve it, but the idea is that information is added or subtracted from it by the system. That's a good question, so we have to define what retrieve is. In classical, say, a memory of such retrieve means that you exercise the behavior. But now retrieval, people uh, replace retrieval with reactivation because uh, you don't want to imply that you retrieve only, you reactivate the memory only when you use the, when you exercise the behavior. But that's a very good point. It's, it's unclear. Pl sorry for that. Okay, so I don't want to give a talk. I just want to go fast into that, but we will come back to encoding in, uh, later on. And for that point in time, it's information about something that happens that is converted in information that is stored, that is represented in the nervous system. This is... Okay, so... Uh, memory is defined by me as an internal representation which depends on your experience. So you refer to information at various levels. Let me uh, go on on that. So I come immediately to the real question that I want to pose to Misha and uh, to, to the others. The question is, uh, what is the engram and, and how is encoded? And the uh, memory, as uh, I, I define it, and uh, I, I define it, and it's used in, in uh, th this kind of uh, definition is used in many disciplines in memory now is the retention over time of experience-dependent internal representation of the capacity to reactivate or reconstruct such representations. And I can define external representation uh, simply as a map of event spans in, in neuronal space. This is the definition used by Cooper, very similar to the definition used by Cooper 40 years ago, and I think it's, it's fine enough for that purpose. So without identifying how the content of the internal representation is encoding, Attempts to identify engrams and determine their properties and change over time and model them realistically are bound to remain to fail. I claim that the major question in memory research doesn't differ from the main question in neuroscience in general, 
which is what is the code of the nervous system, how is information encoded. And I wish to give you, a, a, even as a preamble to, to your attack, or maybe not, a, a, a practical question. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, an experimentalist, and suppose I study uh, molecular changes in a circuit that I know encode some memory. I know because if you destroy that circuit, the memory is not there, and many other people, the reviewers of the papers, agree that, that the memory is there, and whatever. It doesn't matter for me. And I find a change. So let's say I find a change in the composition of molecular, it doesn't matter for me now, just an example, composition of channels in the memory. Okay? And I find a change. And the change is there when I do the experiment in such a way that memory occurs, and the change is not there when memory doesn't occur. For me to decide that that change has anything to do with memory is impossible, although papers will still be accepted, because I don't know whether this change has anything to do with the representation of the critical information in the nervous system. There are many other possibilities. I'll give you one, which is a very simple one. Maybe it's, 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 it's trivial for most of you. It's not trivial for me. Uh, suppose you have a, a model in, 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 in memory research that claims that uh, with experience we generate new uh, synaptic contacts. Okay? And I generate new synaptic contexts, and I see that when I do an experiment in a new system, there are new synaptic contexts in the cortex, that, just as an example. Okay? But who knows whether these synaptic contacts are related to the information that I encoded or to new computational space that I have to generate, it, generate there because they say, nobody in memory research, in experimental memory research, I take the, 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 the prerogative of saying nobody knows to right now how to distinguish between the two. Impossible. It's possible theoretically, but go to the, I, I, I challenge you, go to the papers and show me how to do that. Nobody does that. Why? Because we don't know how the information on that particular item is encoded there. So that's nice. There are people who work, beautiful, ex beautiful experiments done, for example, on methods uh, that the brain uses probably to encode space. Beautiful. Okay? I don't know whether this how this relates to a specific content, I would use the, what is your C? I am going to use semantics, but in a different way than the others. The content of that information, how is it encoded there? Now, without knowing that, Misha, there is no way I can generate a model which will be testable for you because I need you to start and give me an idea how information has to be encoded specifically for that. Thing. Without that, memory research remains at the level of plastic, plasticity research. Which is different. Which is different. Plasticity is extremely important. We assume those are the tools. Those are the tools used by the nervous system to keep the information, the changed information over time. But most of us study plasticity. We don't study the memory because we don't have the code. So I would say that the most important question for me as a memory researcher is to go to Misha and ask Misha, don't be offended, all of you, okay? I will go to Chaim, I'll go to Tali, I'll go to wherever necessary, but to go to Misha, because it's close, and say, Misha, without you, theoretician, show me the light and tell me, how can I do an experiment that will show that item A is encoded in that and that code in this system? I will not be able to know whether the changes in that system relate to the memory or just to something that relates to the memory, but it's not the memory itself. Sorry? No, that, th those are two, no, it's just, uh, the no is not a no, it's just a way of talking. Uh, I wish to end up with an experimental approach. I wish to go to the nervous system and do something there and change the information, let's say, simulate the information, s change the information. My request from the theoretician proposed to me how information is encoded in such a system? We'll come in a minute to some uh, boundary conditions. How is it encoded there? Without, you don't pay attention to the fact that I, I, it's not personally me, my field, although we study memory, we study behavior on the one hand and we study changes in the brain on the other hand. If we are lucky enough to study the brain, many still would study cells in culture. So it's important. But this is plasticity, and I wish to make a distinction between plasticity and memory. Those are not the same, and there is a confusion. There, is, there are confounds in the literature on plasticity versus memory, and I wish to 
make this distinction clear. Misha can show me nicely how plasticity mechanisms can work. And we can discuss the issues, whether it's correct or not, and how shall I plan my experiments. But he doesn't show me how memory works. I have to challenge him, okay? You want to join? <laughs> so this is not the same. And the major challenge for me facing memory research <coughs> is hence identical to the that facing <coughs> branches of functional neuroscience in general. Identify the code. And I think that people evade that because it's not easy. People evade that. Can I ask a question? Sure. Can you define okay, can you define content experts? Maybe you know there there's a variety of such people people are interested. No, define one. Well, you know, philosophers of knowledge. Okay. So I see your point. I deliberately don't say yeah. philosophers. I wonder how that philosophers of knowledge. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. I can't handle more than one item oh, at a time. My working really memory is <laughs> that's another model I want you to yeah. but you do it anyway. Why why my working memory is n equal one. And one is not an integer. Uh, I think because people who work linguists, okay, I'll take the 64,000 shekel term, linguists, people who work on language as people who work on content, they are farther away from my level of analysis than Misha. Misha deals with, uh, with neural networks, with synapses, and so on and so on. Your people, in general, deal with more abstract terms. And for me to have the translation rules from your level to my level is much more difficult than to go to Misha because he uses the same terms. That's the reason. But I, and also because I probably made a mistake of using semantics. No, 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 so no. you immediately jumped into no. linguistics. Okay. But semantics for me may be just uh, uh, A is larger than B in that system or, or things like that. But still, you, you make a distinction the content and the physical means by which it is imposed. That's a very, that's part of and the, that's maybe that's Misha wants to address it, so I want yeah. to, uh, sorry. Okay. That's critical. Okay. Whether the medium is the message or not, I don't know, but we have to discuss that, and that's still fine with me, show me in my system how the medium and the message are encoded. That's fine. So my wish list submitted to Misha, and by that I end, one and a half slides. A. I urge you to take biological boundary conditions into account. I urge you to do that because I assume, and you said computers, I assume that there are many ways to solve a problem. But there are ways to solve a problem that were shaped as far as we believe in a model, in a theory. That's the only quasi-theory in biology, in the evolution. It's not a theory, but it's a conceptual framework. If we trust that, then this have imposed some boundary condition in the system that will dictate to the system how to behave over time in a way that is not dictated to a computer or to whatever system will be in 20,000 years from now. So I wish you to take that and boundary, biological boundary conditions into, into account. When I was trained in, in neuroscience, this was never the case. I assume it's now more and more the case. And, uh, but still, I wish you to pay attention to that. Because boundary conditions do not necessarily have, from my point of view, theoretical constraints. There might be also constraints that are there because the system cannot behave otherwise. But for you, because the system cannot behave otherwise, for example, why is there consolidation? I can suggest, can propose many ways to explain that, none of them probably correct. I can also say there must be consolidation because it's a protein system and a protein system has a lifetime, a half-life of cells and such, so you have to this is called the, the Panglossian paradigm, which you are probably very familiar, Levantine and, uh, and uh, what's the second one? Gould and Levantine. Uh, so I wish you to take this into account. Misha, I wish you to take the biological conditions into account. I wish you to try to avoid error-related metaphors. So when Chaim says computer and hard disk, I wish to propose that this is as accurate as when uh, in the 16th century somebody said this is an hydraulic system. So I wish us to prefer not to use these metaphors. And this relates to the biological constraints. Well, there is a difference. 
Okay, so I want to I want to shut up in a few minutes. I I want to. There is information also in in hydraulic systems. Okay, so we have. I wish you not to fall in love and let alone create a religion based on. I'm supposed to say some statements here that will invoke some reactions, so that's fine. I'm going to shut up in a minute. Do not fall in love with. If I stop here, that's not what I say. Okay. <laughs> let alone create a religion based on. Jerusalem, I'm careful, global top-down assumptions, not superfluous to keep in mind what Vico said in the past, and if you wish to know, I, um, I, it's my favorite philosopher, so I, 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 in, at, the, at the price of uh, uh, enraging some of you, I wish to bring that, the modesty principle of Vico. He said, uh, it's in Latin, it said, verum et, uh, et ipsum factum, Converter, which means, as far as I know from looking in the dictionary, but it's known a verum a factum, uh, that uh, the, 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 we translate it to in, into the everyday language as saying, uh, those who do know, but you should take it in, in with a pinch of salt, which means in order to understand something, and, and Chaim, I'm not referring to the HBP, but in order to understand, seriously, in order to understand something, what Vico said, you have to be able to do it. So to understand something completely, you have to be able to do it. So if you wish me to understand, if you wish to understand how a network works, you have to be able to simulate in such a way after you model it that it yields what you do. And uh, accordingly, uh, uh, our clear and distinct idea of the mind cannot be a criterion of the mind itself. That's what he said. And I wish to say that if you approach with an a global idea that I will serve, I, I will approach it only in a top-down approach. Only in the top down of no, I'm, I'm intentionally provocative. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work because you haven't done the system. So, do I need to do the universe? To understand the universe, uh, maybe. You have a challenge. No, but How I, old are you? It's clear, it's clear I can and I want because it's a waste of time. Sure. But not uh, the universe, but you have to understand according. But, but I still, uh, uh, you know, I am the physics. They do great things. First of all, their theories oh, might be wrong. Well, the, uh, it's the, again, second, not, you know, uh, no, no, that's fine. Everybody can be wrong, and, we, and uh, as a scientist, I don't want to know the truth in a mathematical way. The I meaning. Want, I, I want to, to know the, the. I want to know it with high probability and to think. You know, not, uh, I don't have this demand that I need to know something or I need to know that it's true or that. So if I find something that changes when I. When, when the memory, when there is a memory, that memory is gone, for me, it's a very big success. And, and for me... Wrong, but you know, I, nobody found anything else. This is the thing I found. Then, most probably, this is what it is. I might be wrong. It's fine, but, I mean, we, we want to work with something. You, we are talking about... Uh, don't take it personally. We are talking... We are, the idea is to debate, not to... Because you sit here, it's only one chair for me. I'm... Uh, <laughs> Let's dissociate between advances and uh, what we are lured into. I claim that if you find something that is associated with a change in memory in the brain and you don't know how memory is encoded, you are wasting your time. I do it intentionally in a provocative manner. I do it. I spend my time looking for changes in the nervous system that change with memory and I'm happy to publish. But I claim that I will be able to do it in a more, in a higher probability of success if I knew how the system stores the memory. Otherwise, I may find that the changes I find are related to what we call housekeeping, to what we call, we'll define in our system, uh, the, need, the future needs of the system in many cases. You know, it's like the classical uh, story of whether you find that if you play tennis, your uh, muscles in the hand uh, are become uh, stronger. Is this because you play tennis, or is, is this you play better tennis because the muscles become? It's essentially the same for me. And uh, the please provide testable hypotheses that we can proceed together and refute models. Because in many cases, and I'll give probably one example here. In many cases, that's the last one. <coughs> in many cases, when I go to talks by theoreticians. There are three orders of magnitude farther away from me in terms of being able to translate it into what I do in the lab. 
And I wish you to try and to close the gap. So here is specifically. Please tell me how specific information is encoded at the relevant level in the behaving brain. Tell me something about specific items and translational rules, which means how can I uh, relate the neural activity to the behavior of tokens, not of types. Types, we are much better off. Types, we are much better off, especially with the work done in recent years on, on uh, play cells and, and so on and so on. Tokens, I haven't seen any advance so far that is convincing for me. And this, is allow this will allow me to determine whether changes observed in the nervous system and body learning and memory are only incidental auxiliary to it. And, sorry? I, I don't hear you. That's the only reason. What do you mean by tokens? Tokens, I mean specific occurrences of a type. For example, a space is a type of information, and the being located in uh, XIJ is the token uh, referring to it. And before uh, giving back the podium to, to Misha, because I don't have anything here to show and no magic, it's interesting that if I look into my field of memory, there is one rule which I would call quote-unquote law that exists over the years and was extremely productive, and there is one guiding rule, or if you wish, law that had existed over the years and was sometimes productive and sometimes counterproductive. And none of them was created by what we would now call theoreticians. I came here to enrage you. The rule or the law, the only law in memory research that exists over, uh, let's see, uh, 40 years now, is the Rescola Wagner law, which says something very intuitive. If there is a discrepancy between what you expect and what happens, you learn there is surprise. And this is formulated very nicely, and it has served very beautifully at various levels of analysis, starting with the circuit in the brain, so the molecular stuff, dopaminergic system, behavior, even explanation of behavior of populations, if I'm not wrong. And this was not based on a top-down approach. As far as I can tell, this was based on analysis of behavioral experiments in psychology. Uh, Bob Rascola was a great psychologist. Wagner was a great psychologist in, in Yale at that time. I think one was the mentor of the other. So the only rule so far that guided experiments and does it beautifully is with us for 40 years and hasn't changed since. Why isn't it top-down, by the way? Psychologists don't do a lot no. of it was not top down because it was concluded from the data that emerged from behavioral experiments. Oh, behavioral experiments are high level. Yeah, high level, but he didn't come and, and he didn't come and said, as far as I know, I had come a conversation with Bob Rescola, but uh, you, the way to terminate a re, uh, conversation with him is to say memory. He always wishes you to, to say learning, as psychologists do. Um, it came, as far as I recall, not from a global theory how the brain should work. It came from data collected over time on behavior of organisms. And well, he was governing uh, a rule which was uh, 10 or 20 years before, before that. Already published by Wagner and Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so here is another rule that was rediscovered, and that's uh, the Hebbian rule, which was also actually a modification of things known at the end of the 19th century. I'm referring to the synaptic rule, not to the ideas on, on distributed, on the assemblies, which were go back to 1805 with Young. And this, in a way, generated, from my point of view, interesting experiments, and people who did them do not need my evaluation, but also was a bit counterproductive, because people tend more and more <laughs> To say Hebian, no, uh, the definition of Hebian has mutated over time so much. Hebian, anti-Hebian. If it, it's not Hebian, where is the Hebian and so on and so on. So for me it's a constraint rather than a, dev a, a device to push memory. By the way, it did drive some molecular studies to show how devices might confirm to that. And so to conclude my introductory remarks, so almost my entire... Uh, uh, ideas here. Misha, bring me some guiding lines. 
Okay. Where shall I proceed? Uh, okay, I think it was pretty fascinating because, uh, first of all, uh, I think Yadin is one of the few researchers who really try to define things. And uh, as I said, the main problem that I see sometimes in, in, in memory field is that there is an ambiguity about the main concepts. And Yadin is really writing books and has, uh, organizing conferences about trying to formulate things. And still we saw that there is a problem, right? Because when Yadin says what is active memory, Heim doesn't understand and, and, and they didn't converge. So I think that's exactly maybe what, at least one of the advantages of uh, thinking in the framework of a particular theory or model is that at least the terms are completely d defined, right? There is no argument. And, and, uh, and I would claim, uh, you know, I said the neural theory does exist, and I, I tend to agree with Yadin, maybe it's not a neural theory, but I will, l let's try to think about it as more like a metaphor, maybe. So I, I want to say that there is a certain metaphor of memory, which was proposed by a physics community, basically, proposed as a metaphor of memory, and this has to be uh, uh, contrasted with another metaphor, which is based on things that people uh, created, like books, and I think hard disk is good enough a metaphor because there is no really much difference on the fundamental level. So there is a one. Solid state is also fine. Uh, I don't know. I would w let let's stick to a yeah. Let's stick to a, a book or a hard disk, which I will think it's more or less the same. And another metaphor, which is based on the whole field model. And and uh, I I would I, my strong conviction is that when Yadin is thinking about memory, he's thinking only in the framework of this metaphor of a book or a, a, a disk. Even when you are trying to argue with this and try to deviate, you still think that this is the, the, the thing, how, think, how memory a priori is working, and then you may want to find the deviation. And uh, I'm just trying to convince you that if you take this other metaphor into account, then maybe we can discover, you or the field itself, that some of the context may not even be there. Right. So what I want to try to convince you is that, for example, some of the things that are interesting for you, like uh, consolidation, uh, engram, it's not necessary that memory should have an engram at all. Okay? Because in the metaphor that I'm trying to, an alternative metaphor, there is no such thing as an engram, I think, if I'm, if I'm correct in interpreting this. So that's what I want to discuss in the, last, in the next uh, uh, 5 to 10 minutes, maybe, or maybe 15 minutes. So I want to, very brief, because I think here people know what Hopfield model is, but I just go briefly through it, and then I want to look at it from the point of view that maybe will be of interest to Yadin. Can you clarify? I, I see it in all the writings, so I just want to ask for him a question so, so that sure. he understand what you mean. Yeah. Yadin does not mean like a book, because he uh, emphasizes that memory is changing each yeah. time something happens in right. the system. So I will say so that Yadin is... No. This is not a book. He's, he's thinking like it's a book, but more complicated. Maybe a book that you rewrite a, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, but his, his basic thing is a book. That's what I think. Well, At least... I, I reserve my comments after after we Yeah, but... Just to clarify what yeah. it means. Yeah, I think that you start from idea of a book or a hard disk, and then you say things are more complicated, they're not as stable as in the book, etc., but you still have a book as, a, as a, the only uh, metaphor that you, you, you start with. And I'm saying there is another metaphor which is completely different and very paradoxical, but I must say I also didn't think about it this way before I started to preparing for this debate. So it's also a new way of thinking for me as well. Your book has changed. My book, uh, my thinking about the uh, book is completely changed, I must say. Okay, but uh, I don't know if how, uh, probably everybody here knows about Hope Mod, but I still take just one minute uh, to go through this because I uh, just, you know, because it will let me uh, going in, in, in debating this. So uh, we have a network. So what is Hopfield model? Hopfield model has these four basic ingredients. There are neurons, uh, but the neurons are very uh, primitive neurons. They, they can be either active or inactive, so you can say it's plus minus one, and there are n of them. 
There are connections, so there are n square connections because any two neurons are connected to each other. The network has a dynamic, so that's uh, maybe a most uh, non-trivial part because these uh, neuronal variables change with time. So if you, if you have a, uh, at any time moment, if you have a, uh, con uh, activities of all the neurons at time t, what you have to do in order to predict what will happen at time t plus 1, you have to multiply for every neuron i, you have to multiply all the other neurons j to the connection strength j, j, sum this up, and then you see this is like a total input to a neuron i. You have to, dis to see if it's above threshold or below threshold. If it's above threshold, it goes into this active state, plus 1. If, if below threshold, it goes to the minus 1 state. And you have a memory pattern. So Yadin kept asking me, what, uh, tell me how the information is uh, encoded. Here, information is encoded is, uh, is this activity pattern. So I'm saying every memory, uh, the only way I can think about it is that it has to be somehow encoded in one of these activity patterns, which is, since I'm considering this very primitive neurons, then it will be a, a activity pattern consisting of plus and minus ones. Okay, so encoding uh, issue here is completely clear. Everything is just binary vectors of plus minus ones. And I have P, I have uh, P, P vectors like this. So I have uh, memory patterns. Each one is this vector. I have P memory vectors. So now, how does the model work? So I, these are just the ingredients. This is what I have, neurons and connections. This is dynamics. This is how the network works. This is what I want to remember. So how I remember these uh, memories, how I store them into the network, I do it like this. I start from tabula rasa, no connections at all. So all of them are zeros. So I remember things one by one. So I just add memories one by one. Every time I add the memory number mu, I, I, I add the term to my connections, j, i, j, as a product of, a, of the activity at neuron i and activity at numero j for this particular memory. So this is a... This is i, j, yeah. Okay, so I, I just continue. Yes, I'm sorry. Don't correct me. Yeah, I will not correct. So this is a i, j. You can say this is a Heb rule. This already dead. And then I do it for every memory. So every time I, knew, I learn a new memory, I add this uh, term. So as a result, when I, and I have p steps like that, I have a connection, which is the sum of these Hebian terms. Right? So I have a sum of p terms. Each one is this uh, connections. So this is how I remember things. So everything here is well defined. So the, the encoding is in this terms of this part in psi. And, uh, in, and, the, uh, and the memorization is, uh, is changing of the connections. And now how do I retrieve the memory? Yeah. This delta j, uh, j is not the income? I will, I will talk uh, exactly about these two slides down the road. Yeah, I, I'm saying not. I, I'll, see, I'll tell you why, why I think so. So how do you retrieve information? After I remember everything, let's say I want to retrieve the information. So the, thing, uh, the way it works is like this. So I have already a connection j, j. I start with a certain initial state, which is a little bit similar to one of the memories. And the way I think about it is that uh, in order to retrieve a memory, I need a, a, some Q, so some partial information about what memory I want to retrieve. So I, it means that I provide, I, I initialize my network in a state which is a little bit similar to a memory that I want to retrieve. Then I run my dynamics, and the result of this is that my network will converge to a state that exactly corresponds to a memory that I want to retrieve. So the network converges to a state. Uh, no, uh, uh, yeah, if you can give me a new one. If you, if you ret uh, and then the memory is retrieved, if the network converges to the state that is exactly the same as the one at, uh, as I remember. So because I'm saying information is encoded in the activity, then if I recreate the same activity, then I'm saying the same, the exactly the same memory that I put into the system was recalled. And I have some uh, simulation about it, but l let's pass this. So now I want to really go and, and, and discuss uh, this as a metaphor. So now I, I very intent, very int uh, uh, I, I on purpose present it in a very unrealistic and biological way because I really want now to discuss this model as not as a realistic model of memory, but as a metaphor. And I will, you will see that it's a very paradoxical metaphor, which is very different from our, uh, you, the one that we used it. So let me then f formulate several features of the usual metaphor and this new metaphor. So the usual metaphor, as I said, 
I don't distinguish really a book or a hard disk because I think it's the same thing. So how does the book or hard disk work? So you have, a, you have information that is encoded uh, in bits. I think we'll just have to leave it this way. So let's just look at the left column. So I, I go first over the left column and then I switch to the right column. So how does the... the so... Uh, Oh, the other one. Use this one. Oh, where, where did I put this? Misha, you start Let's again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. So le let's talk. This is a, what I say is a very intuitive framework that we are all. Uh, with, with, that's how everybody is thinking. I think before you, if you don't, if you are not a physicist who who, who know about the Hopfield model. So, the information is represented as bits, and this is true for a hard disk and for, uh, for a book, because for the hard disk, these are the just bits, zero, ones, and for the book, you can think about it is that you have a, you know, every pixel, you either put a paint on it or not, so it's like uh, there is a paint or not, so this is a, obviously bits. Now, how do you store information in the hard disk? You just, uh, for every bit, you have uh, some domain on the disk, and then you magnetize it. You either put magnetization sp uh, spin up or spin down. And again, as I said in the book, you just uh, well, either you put the either you put the paint on the on the paper or you don't put the paint. So these are the the way the information is stored. So how do you retrieve information? Now in a disk, it's very clear there is a special dis device that goes to a certain domain and then read out the magnetization. Right? There is a circuit that, depending on whether the spin is magnetized up or down, it creates a different current, and then this is how the information is retrieved. So. You have to do it bit by bit. And if you read a book, it doesn't have to be really bit by bit, but it's, let's say, depending on how well you are reading, you either uh, retrieve information uh, letter by letter, or if you are really fluent, you can catch the whole word immediately, but still you go from one piece of information to another one. And so the retrieval here is uh, kind of a little bit better than bit by bit, but I would say it's not a crucial difference. So again, this is the same thing. Now, this is an interesting point. So when you retrieve information, does it somehow interfere with the storage of information? Now, obviously, if you read the information from the hard disk, you absolutely not uh, affect the storage because these are two completely different processes. Also, when you read a book, you are not changing anything about the book itself, right? When you, when you write a book, you put a paint on the paper. When you read a book, you actually use reflected light and your brain to read the book. So also here, when you store the information, <coughs> you magnetize the, the domain and the disk. When you read it out, you, you use the, this magnetization. You, by no means you want to change this magnetization. This is a crucial thing because this is why our computers are so stable. If you, you can switch off your laptop and come to, tomorrow and you are quite sure that everything that was on your disk will remain the same. Also, you can read the information from your hard disk, and you're quite sure that this didn't change uh, the, the information. Now, is the information is stored? So, so, so the retrieval and storage are two completely different processes. Is the information localized or not? It is localized, right? And obviously, because every bit is, is stored separately, and every letter in the book is stored separately. You don't have different words or different letters uh, occupying the same position in the book, because other, if, if this would be the case, you would never be able to read the book. So, you know, everything you said would change immediately if I just, let's say, encrypt the book somehow. And, and do something which is rather obvious, but actually we do it all the time on the disk. Yeah. It's not localized anymore. Yeah, but I, I want, want to go to the bay, how things are... Then you can use your software to do many, many it's things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we can discuss it. But to me, it's everything you do later with the software, it's already... Yeah, but, but there are things to discuss in yeah. the Okay, so now that's a, another crucial thing. Is there a p trace that is persisting? Here, it's obviously, there is a trace that persists as long as the memory is stable, right? So you have a, you have a bit of information that is stored as magnetization. If magnetization is still remaining, you have this bit available, the moment you, you change magnetization or erase it, the bit disappears, right? So the, there is a, clearly there is a trace that is persisting, uh, which is specific to a particular memory, okay? And this is, I think, what's really a crucial thing. That's why we are always thinking that if the memory is persisting, it means that there is something that has to persist there. 
Persisting means uh, just remaining, you know, not erased, you, you, not modifiable. There is a, a permanent trace. So if you put a bit in your hard disk, you have a magnetization that spin is looking up. So this has to remain as long as you want this bit to remain on your disk. So press. Let, let me, yeah. And then how do you retrieve information? What are the cues? I said to retrieve information, you, you always need a cue. So both in the book and the hard disk, you just retrieve it by location. If you want to read a certain passage from the Bible, you have to know on which, on which page and on which line it is written. Okay? And also, if you want to retrieve a file from a disk, you have to know the address of the corresponding domain. Okay? So this is one metaphor. So now let's go to the Hoppel mold that I just introduced. And, uh, and I think if I'm not really confused of myself, we'll discover that it's really paradoxical if we go and look at this. So what is the representation of the Hoppel model? I think it's identical here, right? Because as I said, this are plus minus ones. So these are still bits, firing, non-firing of a neuron. Now, how do you store the information? So here there is a difference, but it's still not a... Uh, Okay, it's a quite a big difference, because here what we have is that for every bit that you want to remember, you have, a, uh, you have a storage place, right? For every bit in the book or in the, uh, in the computer, you have one bit, you have a one storage position. Now, here it's already not, because you don't really uh, do anything with the bits when you remember, but you modify the connection. So you have n bits, you have n, n square a modifiable element. So the, there is no one-to-one -one correspondence anymore between the information that you, the, the bits that you, rem that, that you try to put in the system and the, uh, and the modification that you do in the system. Because you, you have at least, the, uh, even the number of bits and the modifiable animals is not the same. Now retrieval is parallel uh, by, by, by design, right? There is no way, if you think about this ma uh, these patterns that you recall, let's say you think about it as a certain image, right? Let's say I remember how my wife uh, a face of my wife, of my, of, my, of my children, there is no way I can extract just uh, one eye out of this image, right? You have to retrieve the whole memory together. So this is very different from here, because here nothing would prevent you to go in a particular position and extract any part of the memory that you have. And this is, uh, I think, uh, interesting, because let's say I'm, if I ask you what's the name of your first teacher, it's, it's very difficult for you to just to give me a name and that's it. You will necessarily will retrieve the whole kind of a lot of other things that are related to your first teacher, which are not really needed to, to extract your name. There is no way you can just, I, just fish for a certain piece of information that I asked you. You will have to retrieve a lot more than this. And this is, uh, in the Hoffel model, this is always happens because there is, you cannot retrieve one bit or, five or half of the bits the only way to retrieve any information is to retrieve the memory as a whole. You can't fish, right? I mean, you can't after you after you retrieve it, you can then go and search for it for pieces. But you, you yeah, I'm, uh, you can complicate things. But I'm saying I, I, I intentively presented a very basic uh, feature variant of the Hopel model. And this, uh, you know, if you don't complicate things, you can only retrieve it together. So we can see how to, I think that in, in, inherently as a metaphor, this is, assumes that you retrieve the whole memories together and not simple pieces. But let, wait a second, because I will go to a more interesting uh, even aspect. So is the retrieval and storage uh, use the same mechanism or not? As I said here, they absolutely use completely different mechanism. Here, I think... Uh, retrieval and storage are using basically the same mechanism. Because when you, s when you remember things, you have to create a certain pattern, and then this leads to, to modifications in the connections. When you retrieve the information, you have to reactivate the same pattern. Right? Now, if you say, if we say that the reactivation of the pattern changes the connection, then necessarily the storage will lead to another, another ret uh, sorry, the retrieval will lead to another uh, storage, right? Because unless the brain uses some tricks to kind of make it, uh, to, to block these things. But uh, if there are no uh, magic tricks, then we would have to conclude that retrieval and storage uh, has to, it's the same more or less process. So this is, I think, very paradoxical because, I, again, if you would uh, think that every time you read a book, you would also write something in this book, 
then it's clear that eventually this book very quickly become a mess, right? Because you will never you will never read it exactly as the first time you read, and if you made a little bit of mistake, you will then reinforce it, then you put it back into the book, and then you will mistake, the next time you will make another mistake, maybe you will not recognize a word, then you will read something else completely. So very, I think eventually, if this is how would you would be reading the book, eventually the book would be completely different from the book that somebody wrote. Okay? But, but you have to clarify, because you say yes. I evoke the same pattern. Pattern, yes. evoke, right, in theory, place. right. But I would say Any that... Noise that is left to change. Yeah, I will, I will show you that it's not only noise. So if, this, the, if everything works perfectly, you will retrieve exactly the same pattern. But as we, you know, people who work with the Hopfield model, and I will show you one example, typically you should not expect that when you retrieve a memory, it will be exactly the same memory that you put in. So you necessarily introduce some modification. So now what this will mean is that every time you retrieve a memory, you change it. And so, and so, as I said, this is a paradoxical thing, because if you think about, if you would read the book like this, then eventually this would be a completely different book. Now, there is a, a distributed representation. This is obvious. Now, that's a, a most interesting thing, I think, and paradoxical. Is there something like a, tra a persisting trace? And I say there is no persistent trace. And Haim asked me, how can it be? And uh, I don't know if you still believe that it cannot be. I'm claiming that in the Hopfield model there is no persisting trace. Why, why there is no persisting trace is because if I, I learn, I <coughs> if I learn a memory, I, I add this modification to the synapse. But the moment I learn a new memory, I will put modification to the same synapse. So nothing. So if I, when I learn the new mem the first memory, I had a certain trace. And if I didn't learn any new memories, then I would have this trace to persist. But the moment I, I put in a second memory in the same network, I already all of my connections will be completely different. So I don't know what would be, what would I have to... Right. Right. Okay, so this, uh, that's an, a, a thing. So let, let me then maybe I jump. So what is really engram the way that uh, Yadin and his predecessor understand. So, uh, Engram is, uh, I'm now quoting Yadin, basically. Uh, although I think the first uh, author who pro uh, proposes it is Ashley, but uh, I, I really am more influenced by Yadin, even before, okay. Okay, so I'm, then I'm not uh, updated. So, but, uh, so I actually wrote a review about searching for an engram, but what is engram? So Yadin says in his book is that this is a, a, a physical record of a memory, and I really want to emphasize for A. Because what Heinz said is that if, you have a, if, if I know all of my connections, this is a physical engram but for all of the memories that are in the network, right? I could just go and, and dig one by one all of the memories. So as long as these connections remain, I have all the memories in place. If I destroy them, I will forget everything. But, but uh, the way I, they are thinking, you know, Yadin and, uh, and, uh, and other people, this is motivated by this metaphor of a book where there is a, a trace for each memory separately. So Engram as a, uh, as a trace, as a physical record of a memory, or this is another quote from Yadin, that there must be some form of engram to ensure the persistence of memory. And again, he doesn't put A here, but he means here one particular memory. He doesn't mean all of the memories that I remember, right? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm quite sure from the context that you, you mean here a memory. So when Yadin talks about uh, engram, and I think the whole field, when they talk about engram and traces, they mean about, they, what they actually mean, they, they mean a trace of a particular memory. And they have this intuition that when you remember things, you put a trace, and this trace has to remain there for the memory to still exist, right? And I'm claiming that in the hotel mall, this, this is uh, meaningless because, as I say here, I keep changing my trace every time I put new memories, and still my memories don't disappear. So there is, not, there is no... This trace that I put here when I, when, I, when I remembered something will not exist anymore as long as I remember just an, an extra memory. And if I remember two or three or five extra memories, there will be very different pattern. Uh, physical trace will be completely different from what existed when I, when I put one memory. And yet I can still reconstruct all of my memories because the Hoffel model still works. So I'm saying that uh, the most paradoxical thing if you really try to compare these two metaphors is that... Uh, 
there is no idea of a trace, as I claim. So, and I think it's useful to keep this in mind, that there is at least one metaphor where everything works, but uh, something that you are thinking so much, it doesn't even exist. And I want to tell, t tell you one more provocative thing. Isn't a trace just a stable, stable firing pattern, a stable state? No, this is not a trace, because the moment you don't think about something, your, this firing pattern is not active. It's not there. It's, it's, but it's, it's, it's not there. Less. Yeah, but we are not really talking about very abstract thing. This is here is a very concrete thing, right? You have a trace active if your pattern is activated. If the pattern is not activated, I say the trace is not active. So you may say still exists in theory because you can get it, but if I'm trying to be concrete, this trace is not active. This, this is not a trace because uh, this pattern doesn't exist physically, right? If you would tell me that the moment I remember something, my neurons start firing and then they fire for 50 years, for as long as I remember this, then I would call this is a trace. But this is obviously not how, how the... Because it is the JHA. Yes, so JHA remain in this uh, thing, but they are not, a, they are not the engram for a particular memory. Because, this me because, they are, because I override them again and again when I write in. Yeah, we can debate this. I, I, I had uh, one or two more points. Yeah, let's debate this if you want. Yeah. Uh, shall we debate this, or I just have one, one slide, we can debate everything. I don't know what's the best way, actually. Okay, maybe we, we can stop here and yeah, start debating it. Yeah, let's debate a little bit and uh, So first of all, I wish to correct one thing for the, for poetic justice. Sorry. Uh, I wish to correct one notion for poetic justice. I, I never thought in my life that book is a metaphor for memory. If, if I had to take metaphors, then in the past 30 years, I think my metaphor would be porridge. And uh, I think it's less intelligent than books. My mother wouldn't love it, but I seriously think in terms of a sort of a DISA, and uh, to use international language, uh, in which uh, you have certain patterns, and maybe this would have made uh, Danny Amit happy because he would think about glass and, and, and things like this. And this was really my metaphor, porridge. And uh, unless you pull your porridge on the book, they don't talk to each other. So I'm not talking about book. If you talk about books, <coughs> then the metaphor probably you should use is palimpsest, which means that you write something and you write on top of it and you see some of the writing of the previous one and so on and so on, it goes forever. I do it with my books. Yeah, but this is not how, what, no, how the society... So here we have... Yeah, yeah. So, so... No, no, no. Misha is correct. Misha is correct. Normal individuals are not supposed to make, to turn their books into palimpsests. So I still think that when using metaphors, I can use metaphors that are not legally allowed by <laughs> so <coughs> if I would have used a metaphor of writing I would use the palimpsest and not a book because I truly believe and I, I have evidence that I and, and I'm not original I, I wrote it in 89 I think in my book that it's a good metaphor for some at least some memories that you write and you see what was there before and I think that Danny actually one of the first conversations with Danny Amit that I had was on, on palimpsest so uh, this is something we should take into account. So A, the issue of metaphor. So let's decide that the metaphors are not, th this is a legitimate metaphor, but I don't think it's, a, it's an updated metaphor. I think very few who think about biology of memory seriously would claim that that's a book, but they wouldn't claim it's a hard disk either. So we should probably be careful of the metaphors. Second, you have an engram. You have an engram. But your engram is on a different level than Lashley thought. And also, your engram is limited in time, which is excellent for a metaphor for porridge or a palimpsest. You have an engram, and actually, while listening to you, I came to a conclusion that might be some surprise to me when I thought about it. <coughs> your engram is the change that occurs in the synapse. I'll take a synapse here for the purpose of discussion. It doesn't matter for me if it's cell-wide or synapse. It's usually cell-wide as well, but that doesn't matter. So in a node in the system, there is a change in your models. 
So my engram is the change in the node in the system, and the persistence of the engram is until next time I learn. So the memory changes over time, and this is exactly what I tried to show. So it's fine for me, because nothing in the engram definition said that the engram should stay forever. The engram stays until next time you use it. Next time, that's how I feel. So, feel is not the right time. That's how I think. Think is not, I feel that think is not the right time. So, that's how I believe. That the engram stays until next time you use it. So we don't differ too much in that. But there is something very interesting that you brought up. You dissociated between the engram and the content. Because my engram is the synapse. It's the node in your system. And that stays there. But that engram, its contribution to the content is not straightforward. Because a change of that engram, and I don't know how to translate it, can change many memories because it is shared. But I don't see that as a in principle question. I see it as a practical question. Can you show me how it happens? But the engram is still there, which means if I search at the level of the synapse, I wouldn't find the content. But that's clear to me because I never claim that I will find the content. Actually, I think that the content is at the level of the circuit. So we don't differ on that too much. Your presentation, don't take it personally, is exactly for me the issue that would drive away most of the experimentalists from a very fruitful, and it can be extremely fruitful, conversation with the theoretician, because, with the modeler. Because, in your case, with the theoretician and the modeler. Because you immediately start with the formal language of saying, I have this uh, integral of, let's say, a, x, i, and j. And I, the poor guy, it's fine for me, but the poor guy comes and says, okay, give me the translation rule from x, i, j to the entity they can measure. So, in that case, it may be simple, because you may say the state of the synapse, and actually you made your model very simple, so you have plus or zero or minus one and plus one. That's fine with me, but, and it's fine. But then you would immediately say this is a very simplified model, because that doesn't happen in synapses as far as we know, and I don't take cell-wide account into consideration. So I would say, unless we meet together at a level where you come with your XIJ and I came with my pipette and we can say if I move that, that will move the J in the X, then we wouldn't be able to translate that into, and, and some people do that, teams do that, you did it beautifully with, with, with Henry. So it's doable and you do it now, so it's, it's important. If I would have to say what's the most revealing part for my point of view in what you say is that it's revealing that the difference is not as big as you think. I don't think that the difference is so big because some of the arguments you placed in the mouth of my profession are outdated, which means we do not think that memory is there to stay, we do not think that it doesn't change, and we do not think that the engram is a, a combination of synapses that are there forever. Or maybe we are wrong. The more you work, the more you find that there might be subpopulation of synapses that stay there forever. I don't know. You should tell me. Uh, there are percentages of synapses that do not change. I, that's what people tell me. So taking this assumption that we are wrong into account, into consideration as a fact, I think that we both agree that A, memories are very labile, we both agree that memories, at least at the level that we are discussing, cortical memories or whatever, not reflexive memories probably, uh, are distributed and at one node can participate in more than one. We think so. Okay? We don't agree on how to translate your terms into entities that I can measure, which is doable in the case of heavy and synapse as it was done, at least as a metaphor and a metaphoric level. And my question is, how this all is related to the, what I refer to as the basic question from my point of view, and this is how information is presented. And you actually, in my view, confounded type with token. Because you say, it's, you didn't say trivial, but you say it's, 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 it's very clear that X, I, J represent something. And I would say this is the type of information represented. But for me, it's important to know why the rat goes 
now 22 degrees to the left. And you would say the system that encodes that uses x, i, j to encode that and that and that, and I want to see exactly what happens there in the terms of content. And this divide, or this distinction, or this gap between the type and the token is a mystery for me and is an obstacle for a fluent conversation that will enable you to test, enable me to test your predictions. He is, he is there. No. no, no, let me just let me just tell you why. Hope field or hopeless? Gives you a model, he, gives you, he gives you a model and he gives you a conditional statement and he says, if I follow the model, here are the consequences. That's what he said, very cautiously. I asked you beforehand and I said, look, this might be a typology of knowledge and you should, you should ask yourself whether this typology of knowledge is, is something that manifests in memory experimentation. And you said to both of us, you said, look, this is not how things work. In reality, there's something different. And the way you said it is by saying, I don't know how to translate your abstract concepts uh, uh, into an experimental uh, reality. And I don't, and, 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 his, and his theory <coughs> is too simplistic so as to hold of, of uh, the complex uh, reality of life. So now the question is, is there any hope from your perspective to a, con to a communication between experimentalists and theoreticians? I don't see, I, you know, I see a very pessimistic perspective that you're representing, and I'm sure that's not what you would like to endorse. So first of all, I'm... I know you're an optimist. I'm an optimist, and I think there is lots of common ground, and uh, I think that the divide, yeah, uh, tachless, that's... Uh, where? Uh, where? So, for me, it's easy to pinpoint a level which was much more productive, a level of analysis or description, which was much more productive in, uh, in, in neuroscience in the recent decades, which is molecular neuroscience or cellular neuroscience, and models which are much more, I would say, traditional in, in, in the conversation between the various subdisciplines in neuroscience, which in this case would be the Hebian synapse. So if you go there and you say, if you have a team of theoreticians and experimentalists and they would try to translate some of the properties or manifestations of Hebian rules into synaptic action that's doable, at least in nice models that work or nice hypotheses, those are uh, testable and they yield interesting issues like molecular entities that could fit into uh, steps in the operation of such a synapse. That's doable. I think the problem comes back to on the table bec uh, when Misha describes uh, Hopfield models uh, as global uh, operational uh, views of, of how memory works because I would come to the uh, conclusion that I wish him and me first of all to find out where the critical elements of that specific information is encoded. Because when he comes and says, I think that in this system the information is distributed and you have that and you have that and you have that, and I ask him what the information is. So this is still, the, the, this is the clash, with, it's not a clash, this is the distinction between his approach and mine. He seems to care less about specific information in the system. He, he likes I hope so. He likes more to play with possibilities that can encode information in a system. I would urge him to look for specific cases and show me how this is embodied in, in that system. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
Too easy. Too easy. Too easy. No, the prediction is not specific. That's my view. I said no. It's, uh, it's an argument because 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 a you said whenever 100 cells fire, these particular cells fire. How do they fire? When do they fire? You don't tell me that. You say something in general. B, you are approaching, indeed, the sort of bridging the divide. Let's find a system in which you know from various biological experiments and cause the face of my mother-in-law. I don't want to involve my wife because this is recorded. So my mother-in-law. Okay? So you have a mother-in-law cell, a system. And you say, according to your prediction, whenever this fires, that's your mother-in-law, and whenever this fires, it's your father-in-law. Okay? Your father-in-law. Okay? They meet together. So, my urge is for theoretician and experimentalists to decide this is indeed the system. I predict that if the spatial-temporal pattern of firing in this system is such, this will give that sensation. And this will give that sense. That's fine with me. I don't know of any system in which it happened so far. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. I wish, so I would become a, so first of all it's beautiful, and second I will become a sort of a critical reviewer and say what is that you have reactivated? Have you reactivated the general terms of fear of A? Have you reactivated the representation of A? So there is a lot of mileage to do, but that's a good approach. Therefore I'm not pessimistic as Yossi is. I'm optimistic, but we have to sort of find together the system which will serve us to study that. If you study only something which is somewhere, and I study only something that I know how to listen in order to make sure that it has something to do with my system, it won't work. We have to decide together how to do it. So there are systems like that. Uh, I'm not pessimistic. I just want us to talk on the same level. So let me just try to organize. Yeah. You so finished your... So I would like to ask whether the problem that you're describing now, which is research on the brain at the system level, is really a problem of theory or maybe it's a problem of experiment. Because it seems to me like what you're telling us is you want to study as an experiment, as an experimentalist, you want to study memory, but you actually don't know how to do it. You know how to study plasticity. So maybe the problem is that experiments doesn't have the right tools uh, rather than the problem being with theory. I know how to study memory by jumping over the, some levels of description or analysis. I know how to study memory because I can induce the change with a memorandum, with a stimulus, and I can induce the change in behavior and relate that stimulus to a change in behavior. So from a classical point of view, which is a behavioral change, memory study is beautifully done, and I can also convert it into formal laws. So, like uh, rules, like for example, Riscola, Wagner, et al. Okay, this is this doesn't have any biology in between. The original one was behavior and formal, no biology. You can have the Riscola, Wagner without them, and the, indeed, I think the Riscola. I cannot talk on his behalf, but if you destroy the brain, not his, he wouldn't care. That's that's fine because of so on that level, it's fine. I do not know, I know of some candidates which are very good candidates to study the in-between levels, which are the, circ the standard circuits. And there are some good candidates for that. But so far, as far as I can tell, there isn't a single system in which you can go to the system and say, take the system and say, I know how the system works from the point of view of the formal description, and this is embedded or in, in the biology in that and that way, 
And you can do that experiment which will provide that, that uh, prediction which will provide that result. Even the simplest systems that were studied beautifully, studied beautifully for 50 years, like 1970s, that's 40, more, over 40 years, like in Aplysia, very simple system from the point of view of those who work on memory, I assume, there is a beautiful body of work on synaptic changes and cell-wide. We'll take it to the same level. But I don't think that seriously people went into the representational level of what's described there in a way that equals the beauty of the molecular work. And the predictions are, from my point of view, not sufficient enough to justify Misha's content with his models. I may be wrong. But nowadays, when people go and do beautiful work, for example, on, on, on place, representation in the hippocampus, and the hippocampus is, from a physiological point of view, a simple system. Maybe it will work. And last point, we don't know what a simple system is. <laughs> we don't know what a simple system is, because the anatomy, if it's complex, doesn't mean that the system is not simple. It's the, he's the boss. Not exactly. This is how this memory okay. is stored. This is how the memory is stored, and you want to somehow try to experimentally verify it. Now, uh, you know, another person might come in and say, hey, maybe it's not, uh, it's, that is not where the memory is stored, but that's the retrieval mechanism. So how do you distinguish, say, between the two, even once the theoretician makes it possible? One thing that I agree, I think we agree, Misha and I, you cannot dist distinguish between encoding and retrieval. Uh, by the way, therefore, when I read papers, for example, in molecular neurobiology that claim we saw changes in the molecular cascades that relate to retrieval, my answer to that is impossible because we retrieve information a fraction of a second and the cascades you describe uh, last for seconds or minutes. So I think whenever you retrieve, you also encode, and whenever you encode, you also retrieve. I think those are the same from my point of view, but th that's my view. I'm entitled to retrieve my view, but I may be wrong. So uh, I think the, in that we agree. Therefore, many models of acquisition, of encoding, would not hold if you go to the level of description of molecular cascades because they are too slow. They can be model of, models of acquisition of transformation of short into long, but they cannot be models of encoding instantaneously information. This should be on the biophysical level. I think that, in, uh, again, it's uh, not something which is based on <coughs> great theoretical appreciation of, of uh, which I lack, but I think that they are inherently embedded into each other because we change the memory every time we update it, we use it. So how can you distinguish to them? Just to give you an example of what I showed in the initial slides, when we talk about reconsolidation, which means the consolidation that comes after, we think, hypothetical entity, it comes after retrieval, we look for boundary conditions, which means when does it happen, and we find, I can give you references for that, for example, a paper with, that I had with Richard Morris in 2007 in neurons that shows that the, in order for, have, for you to have reconsolidation, you have to have an encoding element in the situation, otherwise there wouldn't be. So I think they are embedded into each other, and I think that you cannot really, and I think you would agree, dissociate encoding from retrieval. In, in I'm talking about instantaneous retrieval and instantaneous encoding, not necessarily skill acquisition, which takes many increments, and then we can discuss what increments mean, or about long-term, conversion of short into long, which might be in parallel and very different, and you have time to do it. Okay, so this is Misha. I, have, uh, I think I'll, I'll show you just two more slides, uh, <coughs> and uh, we can then just free discuss freely. So, uh, first of all, I think what Yadin says is very legitimate. He's telling me this is not really a way to talk to experimentalists. Right? The yeah. way I present the Hopi model is just, it's 
sounds like physics. No, you basically said this, and I, I agree. I mean, if I would come to you in the lab and say, let's try to do some experiment, this is not what I would do. But I think that before we actually get to the point where we can really discuss some concrete experiments and ways, that maybe it's uh, also useful to think about more abstract things. And then that's why I said on purpose I presented this model in this very, very artificial kind of way. Uh, but eventually, we have to get to the idea where I have to propose some experiments to you. And this is, I'm still not there, but I think in the next slide, maybe I, I will make an attempt. But that's a language barrier that is really possible. You will have to prove, and this will require an effort from both sides. My feeling, what I started is that I feel that the memory field, experimental memory field, is kind of ignoring these uh, kind of models. And that's why I think I'm trying to tell you that uh, by thinking in this metaphorical way, maybe just give you a new way of uh, approaching the things that you address, and this may be useful even before we converge to some particular experiments and things. So this is uh, my attempt actually to go towards you, and uh, I know there are these things that you are d interested in and discuss a lot in your lectures. So I wanted to see if you now take this uh, metaphor of Hopfield model, what can you say about this? Maybe you we can think something interesting. So for example, forgetting. We all know that we forget things, right? Otherwise, I mean, we would be in trouble. Or maybe some people would like this. And so when, uh, when you s mention forgetting, I, I heard many times that you say, I mean, forgetting could mean two things. It could mean that the memory is lost or that it's still there. And, but you cannot access it, right? And I think when you mean, again, I'm, I feel a bit weird because I always try to interpret your thinking to yourself, but, make my, but uh, uh, a way I understand this when you say that, if, that the lo memory is lost is really when the trace is lost, right? So you can say, naively you would say, if there is a loss of memory, it means that the trace that you put in the system when you put the memory is lost, then the memory is lost completely, or the, the trace is still there, but you cannot access the memory. Okay, so this is, would be two ways of uh, explaining why sometimes we forget things. Now, I'm, I'm saying if you think about the Hopfield meta metaphor, there is no such thing as a loss of memory. Now, think about it. How can you... Let's think about, uh, go back to the Hopfield model and ask, what would it mean to forget a certain memory, right? And not to forget all the others. There is no way. The only way to forget a memory number mu here is to undo this modification that I did when I remembered the memory. So I would have to come to, to put this memory back in the system and do the same modification with the minus sign. Now, theoretically, and then this would mean that this memory will be erased. That's the only way to selectively erase a certain memory. You now, contradict yourself. Why? You contradict yourself because a minute ago you said there is no engram. Yes. So there is nothing there that is stored. Yes. And now you say, in order for me to forget, I have to undo what is stored. No, I had to undo the process that I, that I applied when I stored the memory. I had to apply the same pro uh, process with a minus sign. Yeah, but for me to, uh, to undo means to take something, this was the change, and now you undo it. So this was the engram, and now you undo it. So yeah. you the do agree that the okay. engram is, in your case, at the node level. But this engram doesn't exist. That's fine. Okay, so... That's fine. It's specific as specific is the contribution of that node to the entire presentation. Not in one node. Okay, maybe we are still in, in disagreement here, but... Okay. Yes. I think you. No, no. I, I, I don't want to say this. I want actually say at least in this. Me I, uh, first of all, I'm not claiming Hopfield model is the, the right model. I'm just saying there is no other good metaphor except for this traditional one, and the Hopfield. I didn't propose another one with the palimpsest memory, but uh, at least when I was uh, thinking about it before coming here, I was my, my my intuition was that there are basically two metaphors. But I'm just saying in this framework, to forget a memory selectively would mean the only way to do it would be to come 
and, and do the same process that you did when you put the memory in the system with the minus sign. Now, I don't believe that this is uh, 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 actually... This is the case? Uh, this is the case, yes. Because if the memory is... Tell me, if the memory is encoded in 1,000 1, nodes, there might be two configurations of those 1,000 nodes that give the same memory? I'm, I probably missed the. Uh, no. You have a configuration. I'm okay. saying very two different attractors. You have a matrix of, uh, okay, of two different attractors that give the same representation. Mm, Is no, it no. no, no, no. I have a me memory is just a pattern, so you cannot have two different patterns that are the same memory. So I but define my because that's how I define it. I'm saying it, it, it will be a different memory. Okay. So if you remember a face of uh, of your friend, this is a particular pattern. Okay, this is important because when you come back to what's the difference between retrieval deficit and storage deficit, which are the terms used mm -hmm. in, in, in biology, it comes to that point, which means whether you have when you what's done cannot be undone. Okay, and that's fine. That's fine. It's not only Macbeth. Or no, it can be undone. You are I'm right in the <coughs> that two different sets of connections like this can have can store yeah, the same, that could same be. value. Yeah, that could be. So, so you see the but confusion I'm is between the JAJs and the yes. activation of the cells. Right. It should be, because it should be separate. The yeah. memory cells is yeah. the matrix of connections. It's not the activation. Right. To retrieve the memory, you right, have exactly. to generate the activation of this mm -hmm. memory, of this engram. So that I, I believe is the engram. Mm -hmm. So that's what you said. I right. Yeah, yeah. I think you said it's not one-to-one, -one, the engram. There are many that's fine. The that's fine. fine. So I'm, I'm basically saying that if you, are, if you forgot something, but didn't forget things, other things, a similar one. Let's say I forgot all of a sudden how my friend looks, a particular friend, but I still remember how another friend of mine looks, and I more or less met them at the same time. I would say this cannot be a loss of a memory, right? Because I cannot imagine how I would undo this one particular modification that I did without undoing any others. And if I want to destroy the memory, I will automatically destroy all of my memories of this particular type. So I'm saying... There is uh, a biological way of doing it. Uh, okay, maybe. If you yeah. want, but uh, yeah, intentionally. You no, know, if you assume that whenever a memory is activated, the synapses become amenable to a razor, okay. this is the assumption of uh, yes. biology now, then when you activate the memory, you can undo all the specific contributions to that memory. And you would say, when you do that, you also erase other memories. You will erase among other memories. That's fine with me. Yeah, that's fine with you. I'm saying, if I forgot a particular thing, let's say you forgot a particular thing. Yes. I'm then saying that, for me, it was probable, this would mean that you have a problem of access, because maybe other, you reinforced other memories, so they become so strong that this memory is not a attainable. That I can understand in this framework how you can get. But there is no way to forget one specific memory. What you can do, let's say uh, I apply one of the drugs that you use in the lab, right? And your drugs presumably undo all of the modifications that I did after a certain moment. Or let's say I, I go into, I, I get a car accident, and let's say as a result of the car accident, all of my modifications that I did in the last two days are undone, right? So because they were not yet matured, etc. So this would, me, this would lead to the loss of all of the memories that are stored after a certain time. So this is perfectly possible in this model, and this would be corresponding just to a retrograde amnesia. Right? So a retrograde amnesia, why I think it's actually compatible with the Hoffman model is because, from what I know, retrograde amnesia means that you always forget all the memories that you are stored at, in certain mom at a certain period of time. You never forget some of them and still and, and, no. and retain. Okay, but maybe that's I'm wrong. That's fine. In a as, a, as, as in the idealistic way. So I would say the Hopfield model is compatible with re retrograde amnesia, which is based on times when you remember things, but is not compatible with truly forgetting what you would say, truly forgetting or erasure of, of selective erasure of certain memories and leaving the other memories that you acquired more or less at the same time. So that's, I think, a simple uh, thing. And now... Uh, no, I think uh, I, want, I, want to I don't know. Exactly, which I want to propose I don't know. that whenever you have a specific loss of memory, it's not a specific loss of one memory. And 
that will solve your problem. Okay, maybe. All think. That's true. And I think you would agree to that also. But I think we all have an example where you forget very specifically. When I forget a name of one of these students here, it's always because I'm in the wrong context altogether. And I forget other things or I'm confused or something else. And then the memory comes up because the context changes and it brings up lots of memories, including this one. Yeah. yeah, I think I agree with you. I think you, you don't really lose memories in this kind of selective way. The m most thing that sometimes happens is that you lose a whole kind of bunch of memories that you acquired in a certain context, and then if for some reason this, all modifications were not uh, reinforced, then you lose all of these memories together. But I don't see any way, in this framework at least, to lose a particular memory. And again, this is very different from another... Because in the disk, there is no question that you can just lose one memory and keep all the others if something happens with this particular... No, I think, but I think uh, it's... Imp it's I, I don't know why you're so against, because I think that's a perfectly legitimate uh, metaphor, and I think maybe one day people will find out that our brain also uses this way of storing. You know, I know people who yeah, propose. I, I think that so I don't think anything is completely wrong with this, uh, with this idea. Before we go into consolidation, so your model here makes some prediction, but this prediction either cannot be tested or are too gross. I, I agree. So these are not yeah, the I right predictions I that I will come, I come to you. I come back to the question asked here whether there is any evidence for the loss of a specific memory. So amazingly, the entire field of amnesia, which is in the field of, let's say, 130 years at least, or something like this, cannot to this day convincingly prove that what is done there, unless you really have a vision that takes the entire brain out and you become a politician. Otherwise, yeah. if this happens normally and you have an amnesia, it's very difficult to, to prove that you have a storage deficit or a retrieval deficit. It's because to make a proof storage deficit is to say, I cannot find conditions under which I can <coughs> detect this memory. But this is proof by negation. This is all obvious. It's obvious, yeah. yeah. So, you, I, I would expect predictions yeah. I have an another, this is not prediction, this is about still trying to say you that, it, that the it's a... Yeah, I agree that in, in practically we will never know if you forget, yeah. practically if you forget something, <laughs> you can only know that the memory is not lost if sometimes later you still, it comes back, okay, but if it doesn't come back you have no way to, to test this, but I'm just saying that in the context of the whole field model, it's not even clear how, what is the total loss of memory. It it's doesn't exist. There is no way you can lose one memory out of the whole field model without losing the rest. So the whole discussion is actually, I'm saying in this case, maybe the only interesting thing that you can conclude from this, that at least in this framework, there is no point in discussing this dichotomy because one possibility doesn't exist. And finally, I want, just to I, I want to comment on this because I know this is very close to kind of your heart. So what is consolidation? I, the way there is a kind of definition that people do, but for me, when people talk about consolidation, it's just making memory more permanent than when you first form it. And there is a lot of evidence that there is something like this in our brain. Right? We know that if you, if you learn something and then have a good nap, then you remember things better than if you immediately go and uh, play something and something like that. Right? And, and there is a lot of experimental evidence for consolidation. So what would this, again, can you consolidate one memory in the Hopfield model without consolidating all the others? And that you can do, because in the, in the Hopfield model you can just, if you go back to this, uh, you can just say, if you, if you repeat this many times, let's say when you consolidate the memory, and this is, I think, the only way to consolidate the memory, this particular memory, because I think consolidation is really specific for the memory, right? If I consolidate one memory, I, can, I, I don't think that you automatically consolidate all the other memories that are somehow occupying the same position in the brain. So, and this is perfectly possible here because the simpler way to consolidate the memory is just to repeat many times. So I would say in this framework to, to consolidate the memory is just to retrieve it. And this is, I think, that's what you are, that's what you are claiming, right? In this new framework that you propose, you are saying every time you retrieve a memory, you consolidate it more. This is automatically. But it's sort of cause and effect reverse, because I would say every time you retrieve, you consolidate, and you say every time you consolidate, you 
No, no, I'm saying every time you retrieve a memory, you make it, you, you consolidate yes. it more. But there are other ways. And I would say then the reason that it happens when you take a nap is that you are just dreaming about the memory. That's the only way I can really think about it. Okay, so I, I, I'm happy that here we really agree. And then my last slide, I skip this whole thing. Uh, now, what is the experimental? So, really, the killing question is the, the problem is that nobody, I think, why the Hopfield model is still not kind of the model of the memory, and a lot of people just completely ignore it, that we didn't really come up, I mean, not me and not anybody else, come up with a crucial, like, critical experiment that I would tell you, I didn't do this experiment, and if you have this result, Hopfield model is correct, and if you get this result, Hopfield model is not correct. And, it's diff and the, the, the reason is that it's somehow difficult to think about this experiment. So maybe I really propose this as a topic of discussion. I just had a very uh, rough ideas about what would be really addressing the key points, not just some conclusion that that's not necessarily crucial. So what is the real uh, novel thing about Hopfield model compared to, let's say, other way of thinking is that uh, there is this idea of the dynamics that is retrieving, right? The retrieval in the network is that you start from a particular state, and by itself this falls into a certain attractor, and this, at this falling into the attractor is the retrieval of the memory, right? And this falling can be a very long change or chain of modification. So I can have a particular, that's what I wanted to show you, that you can make a, a model where initial state that you will start with and the final attractor can be completely different. So the, the, you may have a situations where the queue that you provide, the, the initial state of the network and the final memory state can be very different. So there must be a way, if this is how the retrieval works, there must be a way by just, if you observe enough neurons, there may be a way to directly demonstrate that if you, let's say, recall the, the, the face of your friend and I give you different queues, so I, I, once I just I show you his, uh, I know, very noisy version of his face. And this time I just, you know, give, call his name. Next time I maybe give you some context that will, that will let you think about this. So it should be that in some particular network, you should, if you record from many neurons, you should see that you start from different positions and you converge to a certain pattern that would correspond to the face. And I think... Now that people can record from hundreds of neurons simultaneously, I don't see any fundamental reason why this cannot be done. So if we would just uh, convince people to, to do this kind of experiment, so obviously not in humans, but in, uh, in monkeys, maybe in mice, then maybe there is a way. And then there is another molecular approach. So now that uh, we know from your work and your collaborators, you can really undo a lot of modifications that are apparently limited by time. And so this this should make it very, very clear prediction that if you apply these drugs and if you demonstrate that, let's say, they undo all of the LTPs that were performed in a certain time period, you should forget only the memories of this time period, but the previous one should perfectly stay. And again, I don't see if you can really study these drugs more comp quantitatively and you can really specify these time periods when they undo the LTPs, LTDs. I don't see any... Uh, the fundamental reason why you couldn't then come to the mo monkey, give this drug, let the monkey re re remember a lot of things over the course, let's say, of months, and then selectively let this forget uh, some of the information and on the others. So this would be, I think, uh, uh, would go a pretty long way in, in, in the direction of this. So just two, two, two very brief remarks to that. One of them, I cannot do that. I'm you personally, without, because you're no, no. not. Ah, personally, well. I can do nothing. But I cannot do that without knowing. I cannot do that without knowing how the information is encoded. Because I can do multi-unit recording and do what, uh, for example, Idan suggested. But I have to make sure that the area in the brain where I do that is the area that represents information X, and it's very difficult to do. I, I know very few cases in which it's it is done. And the, ne the second point is, uh, you'll see uh, left, but I, I, I want to explain why I'm still optimistic while seeing that. Because in the past, there was at least one major theoretical assumption that was proven by a very simple experiment to be wrong. And that's the best, which means to prove that something is wrong is, is probably the best approach that we can have and uh, how unoriginal statement. So, for example, the 
the entire idea that appears in HEB uh, in, sh in, in relation to short-term memory, which is the reverberating circuits that keep memory going until it is consolidated into, not the term he was using, into the assembly and so on and so on, into a long-term assembly or into the second part of the uh, trace, was uh, emerging uh, years before him, and I think in the 30s uh, was uh, sort of promoted by Lorenzo Deno, but I may be wrong with the names, and was proven to be wrong very nicely by just doing a simple experiment in which you have spreading depression over the cortex, showing that this does not hamper long-term memory. So the idea that you can stop the reverberations for a long time and still have long-term memory going means that under normal conditions, this doesn't keep the long-term memory going. So we have experiments, but they uh, sort of appear once in, twice in, a d in, in, a, in 100 years that do that. So now that the community is much larger and people start talking to each other because the Hebrew University invites them, we may be more optimistic in trying to find these simple experiments because I do believe that for rules, you need simple experiments like that the conditions for the first one on multi-unit recordings, I think, are going to be found in, in, the, in, in, in the coming years. Molecular biology now can do that very beautifully, not necessarily with the tools that we are using, but can do it very beautifully. But the nice thing about the reverberating circuit was that the idea was so simple and testable that it was approached. The minute the theoreticians would come with ideas that are more complex, we'll find it more difficult to refute them. Uh, but I'm optimistic, unless you erase this optimism with uh, All right, I think that, that this is an optimistic and happy note. We maybe open it for just one or two urgent questions, because maybe we, we are exhausting the, the patience of the audience, but it was really, I think, a wonderful example, actually, of a, of a constructive and, uh, and useful uh, discussion or debate, if you want, between uh, a theoretician and experimentalist who are actually working uh, together for many years, but still had to come here in order to, to really uh, identify the, uh, the, those really fundamental, <laughs> fundamental and crucial uh, aspects of the same story. Uh, by the way, I mean, so may maybe it wasn't clear, but really what we had here is, uh, is the theoretician providing a new metaphor for the experimentalist, but you were using all sorts of metaphors. Some of them were very simplistic and some of them were less simplistic. And, and if the theoretician will only improve the, the metaphors of the experimentalist, I think we already do something very important. And uh, I want to thank you and I want to thank the audience. And I want to remind you that we still have uh, at least one more a debate like this by Elon and Amir, and then we'll try to somehow summarize the whole thing uh, at the end of the, after this last debate. So. Just, uh, I think on behalf of Misha and myself, I wish to thank you for, A, not falling asleep too frequently, because this consolidates only one of the speakers and not the other, and, and second, for inviting us here. It's beautiful, thanks. Whenever you come, you are about invited. <laughs>
נשמע, אנחנו אוכלוסייה קטנה. לא נעזור, גם יש לך עוד
זה יפה שעשית שורט שרפס וקיבלת את הפרקטיקה אבל בשבילי זה עדיין כמו שאני אעשה פרדיקציה שאני אעבור מרשת אחת לרשת שמונים ואחת אם אני אעשה שורט שרפס בקופיות הקרה אבל זה